So any notable events in Latino civil rights history that you can think of. Feel free to unmute to add it in the chat. And again, if you don't have anything, just say nothing. Oh, I see a familiar name in there. All right, Farm Workers' Strike, Civil Rights Act, don't know. Excellent. All right. Um, we are going to go ahead and kind of move on and really, again, kind of um, hopefully teach you some, some new things that you might not have known on coming into this call. So what we are specifically going to be focusing on at the beginning of this presentation is something called the Longoria Affair. It's a really important moment in civil rights history that is not talked about enough. It really isn't. And I, I hope that I can share this with you today and you can have something that you can share with others after this event. But we're going to talk about the Longoria Affair and specifically how that event springboarded into a lot of other things in association history and civil rights history as well. So I'm the one that doesn't like to bury the lead whenever I give a presentation. I'm going to go right into it and tell you exactly what the Longoria Affair was and then give you some background context be, um, to, to fill in some of the gaps. So what happened in this event was that Private Felix Longoria was in the army during World War II and he was killed in June of 1945. If you don't know your history or you're fuzzy on the dates, this is just two months before the war in the Pacific ended. He was killed in the Philippines uh, by a Japanese sniper as he was going on a scouting mission. Three and a half years later, his remains were returned to the U.S. And this seems like a long time, and it is, but it's because at the time there were, frankly, many soldiers who were being killed in the war, and the custom was to bury them locally. But after the war ended, his remains were exhumed and his, his body was returned to the United States. He was from a small town in Texas called Three Rivers. And when his widow approached the local funeral director to ar make arrangements for his wake, she was flat out refused service at, at the funeral home. And the reason for this is because the funeral director said, my white clientele won't like it. You're of Mexican origin, uh, and we just don't do that here in this town. The, the widow herself was really um, distraught by this. You, know, can, you can put yourself in her shoes. She, her husband died in the war three and a half years earlier. She's just starting. She, she had moved on from her life. She, now his remains are being brought back to the United States. She wants some closure, and she can't even get the justice of a burial. He gave his life for this country, but she can't even get that. So she's beside herself. She's a, a relatively uh, quiet woman, somebody who doesn't usually confront people, but her sister is, it, or isn't, I should say. And she is incensed by this and wants to do something about it right away. And her, her sister reached out to a local leader who was very un, unknown at the time named Dr. Hector Garcia. And we're going to get into his backstory in a little bit. But she reached out to him because he had started a veterans organization just very recently called the American GI Forum. And she wanted to see if there's any way, since Felix Longoria was a veteran, if the GI Forum could assist with this issue and with getting him properly buried. So what happened was Dr. Garcia immediately, he was a man of action, he immediately called the funeral director and tried to plead the case, saying, you, you probably need to reconsider this. Uh, he is a war hero. His wife just wants some closure. She, want, she wants him buried in their hometown. Please reconsider. The funeral director said no again, flat out. We don't do this for Mexicans. You are not allowed to hold the service within our chapel. We'll, we'll happily bury him on the Mexican you know, side of the cemetery, but you need to hold the services at your local home or somewhere else because we're not doing it here. And so... Dr. Garcia, again, being a man of action, hung up the phone, immediately called a local reporter and got them all in line and uh, called the funeral director back and said, this is on the record. Do you want to reconsider your stance? The funeral director did not. Uh, he, he, he held firm and said, no, this is just something that we don't do and you have to live with it, accept it. Well, Dr. Garcia did not. Uh, he immediately fired off 17 telegrams. And for those of you that are younger in our audience, telegrams are the text messages of their day, the, the Snapchats, the Instagram, whatever you want to call it, the immediate, immediate communication that was available at the time. 
And again, Dr. Garcia is not a well-known person at this point in history, but he, he sent these 17 telegrams to the president of the United States, the head of the military, his senators from Texas, anybody he could think of that was of, of importance to say an issue is going on right now and you need to correct it. Several people wrote back, but the only one who, who sent a telegram back that had any substance was a junior senator from Texas who had just become a senator, and you may know his name, Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson intervened and said, let me take care of this. I can't, I don't have any control over the local funeral home, but what I will do for you is make sure that Felix Longoria is properly buried at Arlington National Cemetery. No cost to you, we'll take care of it. And so at its surface, you know, this is you know, somewhat of a happy ending, uh, but there's a lot more to it. And I want to, again, kind of focus on how this relates to us, since this is an association audience, how it, how it impacts us as those types of professionals. But before I do that, I want to say the quote that resonated from the, the news article that came out and from the reporter who was listening to the funeral director one of the, the things that, that, that was highlighted and played again and again throughout the, the, the press was this quote that he said, because the whites wouldn't like it. The whites wouldn't like a person of Mexican descent being having the, the services within my chapel. My local clientele would abandon me uh, or be angry and we're just not going to do it. So um, again, just to kind of give you a context of, of when this was, Felix Longoria was was. He joined the army in late 1944, relatively late in the war. He was killed in June 1945, and his remains were sent back to the United States in January of 1949, so three and a half years later. His wife's name, I, I failed to mention that, but she was Beatrice. And um, within the span of just a couple of days, everything that I described happened. So the telegram was sent on one day from Dr. Garcia and was picked up and responded to by Lyndon Johnson the next day and his remains were brought back to the United States um, in mid-January, mid and then he was buried in Arlington in February of that year. So again, I, I, I'm gonna go into a lot of context here and a, a lot of background to fill in some of the gaps, but of what I just described, how does that make you feel? Again, unmute, put it in the chat, whatever you'd, you'd like to know. What, uh, how, does, how does that event make you feel? And if I don't see anything, I'm going to start calling on people too. Okay, normal, upsetting, angry. Okay, excellent, excellent. Yes, and all rightfully so. Um, we are all outraged by this when you hear it today. But I want you all to, to realize that you are looking at it through the lens of 2023. You're not looking at it through the lens of 1948. And I'm not saying that it was any more right in 1948, but there was a lot of context into why this happened at that time. So let's go into that in a little bit. Um, let's go into it. So understanding context of how we got to that, that stage, of how this was just acceptable behavior by the funeral director at the time, you need to understand some of the history that is behind it. And I could give many hours worth of talk on this, and I'm going to just condense it into a minute, about Texas and how it seceded from Mexico and the Mexican-American War and all the context around that, specifically how it relates to Three Rivers, Texas. So this graphic here on the left is, um, if you don't know, Texas seceded from, from Mexico largely because of Anglo white settlers from the United States in the, in the 1830s. They, went, they brought slavery with them, they were able to secede from Mexico and become their own independent country for about a decade or so. At that time, there was a border dispute between where the, the boundary of Texas uh, was and where the where, where, where it crossed with Mexico. And it's represented by these two red lines here. So the one at the bottom is the one we all probably know, the Rio Grande River, which is the border today. But the one up here, is where there was a legitimate claim of where the te Texas border ended, the Nueces River. And right along here is where Three Rivers stood. So it was, it was a town um, kind of based on division just from that angle alone. 
Um, again, kind of Texas was the secession was be largely because of Anglo settlers, and they lived in this part of Texas, whereas this part was mostly Mexican citizenry. And the graphic here on the right is actually, I just took this a week or so ago. This is a Google Maps photo of Three Rivers as it exists today. It's still a small town, but you can see here it's divided by railroad tracks. So when you hear the phrase, the wrong side of the tracks, it's referring to instances like this. There was a Mexican side of town and an Anglo side of town. And the town was founded on that. It was, it was created after the Mexican-American War, and it was based on division. The town was set up with all these, these borders even within it. And if you look at the names, you can see that even more clearly. On, on this side of town, on this side of the tracks, you have Blair Street and uh, Graham Avenue, names like that. But on the Mexican side of town, it's Calle, not, not, not Street. It's names like Hidalgo and Guadalupe. Um, so it's very much set up on division just from the start. So again, thinking about context, uh, the, the um, division was, was there kind of baked into the town. Going more into context, uh, Felix Longoria himself, if he had been alive or you know, if he had any say in this, he was somebody who did not really confront any of the, seg uh, the, the racism, the segregation and all those injustices uh, within his life. And actually his father was you know one of the quote unquote good Mexicans in town that that got along with the the white the white side of town, and he kind of actually reinforced some of these these barriers that were there. So, for example, his father had a fencing company, and they built the fence that that separated and segregated the Mexican side of the cemetery from the Anglo side. So I mention this because when we're thinking about context and whatever we're doing. There's, there's often people that stick to the, the old ways of things and others that want to uh, change things and move them forward. So Felix Longoria himself was from the more conservative side of things. Tom Kennedy, the funeral director that I mentioned uh, in, in the story and in, in the Longoria affair and the events that happened, uh, he himself was also a veteran and he tragically uh, lost a big chunk of his head, had a, a very traumatic head injury during World War II as he was crossing the Rhine. And so he's another person that wanted to kind of just keep things the way they were. When he came back from war, the war, he had a lot of recuperation. He had a lot of things that he had endure, to endure just to get back to some sense of physical normal, normalcy. And you know, continuing along that thought process, he trained after the war to become an undertaker took advantage of the GI Bill and um, wanted just, you know, a steady paycheck to be quiet, to, to move on with his life. And to give you even more context, he had just moved to Three Rivers at the uh, a few months, I believe it was, before the Longoria Affair. So he's trying to establish his business, not alienate uh, anybody and just keep things the way they were. So that I'm not saying what he did was right, but it gives you some context into why he did the things that he did. The... The other player in this is, um, or one of the other players in this is another veteran. So if you don't know, Lyndon Johnson was from Texas. Uh, he actually started off as a school teacher in a poor Mexican school. And we'll get into that into some more detail later in the presentation, but it certainly influenced his life. In 1948, when the Longoria Affair happened, he was, again, just getting into the Senate. He he barely been there at, at all. And this is one of the first things, one of the most important things that he did early on. Uh, but as I mentioned, he was active duty in World War II. And he was a man, when I contrast uh, LBJ with, with Felix Longoria and Tom Kennedy, uh, he was a man that, that did not shy away from confrontation. And you can kind of see this in the picture here. He's very famous for something called the treatment, where he would get up in somebody's face for sometimes hours at a time, he was a very physically imposing man, very tall, and get right up in your face and um, argue his point until you relented. So he was somebody that was not afraid of a fight. Dr. Garcia himself, the other main or the main uh, stakeholder in, in this story, uh, he has an, another interesting you know, background as well that I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail on. But uh, he also was somebody who was not afraid of a confrontation and making things right. His backstory is, is that his family fled Mexico during the Mexican Revolution, despite 
all odds, I think he had eight siblings and seven of them became doctors. Even though he had to walk 20 miles to community college, he was denied residency in Texas. He had to go to Nebraska, I, I believe it was, um, or maybe it was Oklahoma, don't quote me on that, but he had to go out of state to actually become a doctor. And he also was a veteran uh, serving in World War II from 1942, almost the start of the war until the end in 1945. And actually, you know, uh, interesting fact, because he was Mexican, they put him in the infantry right off the bat, uh, but he had to argue, hey, I'm a doctor, you might, I have some specialized skills that you might want to utilize and use me as a medic. Uh, so all this is to say that we, we have these kind of two competing factions that I've highlighted here, but also within the United States at the time. Again, I'm giving you context here that during the war, uh, there, there are people that, or the, let me backtrack a little bit. During the war, there are there's a really big sense of patriotism, right? This is a total war, if you can remember it from your, your history classes, and that it's not like any of the wars that we have experienced in our lifetime. Everything that occurred, everything that, that you did in your daily life was impacted by the war effort. There was rationing. Uh, there was millions of troops that, that were sent off overseas. Rosie the River, all those types of things that you learned in history classes really did impact uh, society. And one of the things that the government used to, to sell this to people, to get them to buy in, is that we're preserving democracy. Life is going to be better. We're going to defeat fascism. The world is going to be in a better place. And a lot of soldiers took that to, to think that hey, if I do my part to contribute here, life will be different for me when I come back. And so just to give you some ex examples of Latino service, specifically within the war, we had over 400,000, some estimates are up to half a million Latinos that served in World War II, and it was very disproportionate, our service. So a quick stat here is that the Los Angeles population at the time, Latinos were 10% of the population, but 20% of those killed in action during World War II. And I've got some other stats here that I'm not going to read off, but you can see that we were very decorated within the armed services as well. So there is a really justified sense of I, we've gone to the war, we fought for our country, we, we defeated fascism. When we come back, we expect things to be different. And so you have some competing factions there because a large part of the country wanted to go back to that sense of normalcy in the pre-war um, pre war atmosphere that I had mentioned. Kind of compounding this too is the GI Bill. And this is really uh, getting into the GI Forum and into a little more context, because if you don't know, if you don't remember from your history classes, the GI Bill was a really tremendous success with the caveat that it was a success mostly for white Americans. So when veterans were coming back from the war, they were guaranteed educational training, being able to go to college, being able to get uh, loans to start business, businesses and, and buy their houses. But there were a lot of barriers put up for minorities. And Dr. Garcia saw this, and that's why he created the American GI Forum from the start, because our community, the Mexican-American community, was not receiving these benefits fairly, was not receiving the benefits that, that they had been promised. And so putting all that together, Dr. Garcia was really good about context and foresight and figuring out how to position civil rights in a way that could be palatable to a larger national audience. So when I talked about the Longoria affair, I didn't emphasize enough probably that he, when he was making national news out of it, he positioned it not as a Mexican-American is being denied funeral rights, but more so that a patriot, somebody who died for the United States is being denied. And look at this injustice, because he knew that within pockets and large pockets of the United States, that that message would resonate much more than something related to civil rights. And uh, as I mentioned, the, the GI Forum was, was founded with, with those principles in mind, with being more patriotic and, and putting on uh, leveraging that patriotism that, that existed in the country at the time. So uh, it was formed because Mexican-Americans weren't able to really utilize the American Legion or the VFW um, and take advantage of, of that community that was there for, for other veterans. So Dr. Garcia created the GI Forum 
and leveraged the patriotism that existed around being a soldier into civil rights. And the way that he positioned this was really interesting as well, that some of the, the stated goals of the GI Forum don't specifically say that we're, we're, we're focusing on civil rights, but you can see how they, they are there in the background. He, he instead said that we're here to, to aid the needy and disabled veterans. We're here to develop leaders and to have education. We're here to pre preserve an advanced democracy. How patriotic can you be right there, right? And uphold the constitution. So, and even the, you know, the, the imagery of the American GI Forum was based off of the American flag. So it, you would be very hard pressed to look at this, to look at their goals and to look at their imagery and say, this is just some civil rights group that we should ignore. Um, he really positioned the GI Forum to be something that most of America could relate to and could support right off the bat, even if a lot of our his efforts were for Latino civil rights. And at the bottom here, I, I didn't mention this, but their motto was education is our freedom and freedom should be everybody's business, which we'll get to later in the presentation. So going back to the Longoria Affair, um, please chat in questions if you have them throughout this. Um, but I want to kind of revisit this because the telegrams that I mentioned are really, really important. Uh, and they, I, I think, are really fantastic um, demonstrations of the a bond and a relationship that would form between Dr. Garcia and LBJ over the next uh, couple of decades. So this first telegram here is from Dr. Garcia. You can't read it. I know. I'll read it for you. And it, it's dated January 10th, 1949. And Dr. Garcia wrote, uh, to Lyndon Johnson, the American GI Forum, an independent veterans organization, requests your department's immediate investigation and correction of the un-American action of the Rice Funeral Home, Three Rivers, Texas, in denying the use of its facilities for the reinterment of Felix Longoria, soldier killed in the Philippine Islands, and now being returned for burial in Three Rivers, Tex Texas, based solely on his Mexican ancestry. In direct conversation with the funeral home manager, he stated that he would not arrange funeral services uh, or use of his facilities because the other white people object to the use of the funeral home by people of Mexican origin. In our estimation, this action is in direct contradiction of the same principles for which this American soldier made the supreme sacrifice giving his life for his country and for the same people who now deny him the last funeral rights deserving of any American hero, regardless of his origin. The Rice Funeral Home is the only funeral home in Three Rivers. It's a typical example of discriminatory practices which occur in our state despite our efforts to prevent them. And we believe action from your office will do much toward the elimination of similar shameful occurrences in the future. So I, I paraphrased a little bit there to get through it quickly, but you can see how he positioned it again as an American hero. He did certainly mention uh, his Mexican ancestry, but the, the overall... Um, theme was that this is just an injustice uh, for a, a war hero, for a veteran, somebody that we really should be honoring. Dr. Garcia did not know Lyndon Johnson at this time, so he didn't know his background and some of the things that would, would influence him. But LBJ wrote back the next day again, and he said, I deeply regret to learn that, that the prejudice of some individuals extends even beyond this life. I have no authority over civilian funeral homes, nor does the federal government. However, I have today made arrangements to have Felix Longoria buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery here at Washington, where the honored dead of our nation's war rests. Or if, if his family prefers to have his body interred nearer to his home, he can be reburied at Fort Sam Houston National Military Cemetery in San Antonio. There will be no cost. If his widow desires to have him reburied in either cemetery, she should send me a collect telegram before his body is unloaded. Uh, I'm gonna skip forward. This injustice and prejudice is deplorable. I'm happy to have a part in seeing that this Texas hero is laid to rest with the honor and dignity his service deserves. So again, um, in, a, in an isolated incident, this is a happy ending, but Dr. Garcia made the, the purposeful decision to make it, uh, for lack of a better word, a big deal. He, he made sure that this was amplified and that the nation heard the story and heard this example of injustice. 
And just to, again, kind of show you um, the some of the, the newspaper clippings that, that came out at the time or, or here on the screen, I'm really sad I couldn't find the, the full uh, image here that is of the this political cartoon that came out. But you can see is somebody dressed in uh, you know kind of KKK attire with bigotry written across the hood in front of the Three Rivers Funeral Home. What you can't see here is Felix Longoria's casket, um, and it says uh, I think a, a war hero denied um, you know, burial services. So this this became national news, and it was a really big event within the civil rights history of, of Latinos in the United States, and it sparked many things to come afterwards. The funeral itself is also very interesting in that while there was no cost for Felix Longoria's widow and his daughter that you can see on the screen here, um, for the actual burial itself, it did cost quite a bit of money just to even get to tech or get from Texas to, to Virginia, to DC. Uh, and again, this is in February. So not just getting there, but somebody who's from South Texas doesn't really have a warm winter coat. And so uh, Dr. Garcia, recognizing this, uh, sprung his American GI Forum into action, did a lot of fundraising to make sure that they they had the proper attire, that they had the proper transportation, that they had the lodging to actually be at the funeral and, and be there for, for the burial of Felix Longoria. It's also interesting to note that LBJ was there at the time, but he was a political realist and he made sure that the cameras did not see him because he knew that a lot of his uh, constituents in Texas would not react favorably to, to seeing this. So he was a realist at the time too. Moving forward though, again, this, this event is something that springboards the Latino civil rights movement in a major way. It springboards the GI Forum as a nonprofit organization into a really national organization that has a lot of impact on US history. And so some of the areas that it gets into are related to segregation, which you can see over here, uh, living conditions and healthcare. You know, you, you've heard of the, the disease tuberculosis, but it, uh, and you think it was a long time ago, but it really wasn't. It was ravaging the community back then. And Dr. Garcia knew that as a doctor, and he knew that the, the disproportionate effects that it was having on our community. So he, he tried to, to do things about that. And one of the areas that I'll go into in a little more detail is voting rights. So like our like like our black counterparts, our African Americans in this country, Mexican Americans also endured a lot of voting restrictions when um in, in the post-war period. So things like poll taxes, things like literacy tests were not were there and were preventative um, from from our community being able and being um, offered the, the right to vote. So kind of moving on, um, the way that Dr. Garcia uh, started to, to leverage his community, and again, I'm trying to tie this back to associations, you, you leverage your membership, you know that what, what motivates them and, ha and how to interact with them to get the, the best results. What Dr. Garcia did was, was recognize as Mexican Americans uh, of the GI Forum, there was a lot of cultural elements that he could leverage to make this a, a family affair because we are a very family-oriented culture. And it might seem silly at first glance, but one of those really big things that they did to tie this back to the, the family and, and the community and get not just the veterans involved, but the, the entire um, you know, family group was to have beauty pageants. And again, this, this might seem silly on its surface, but they had a lot of beauty pageants. And I mean, a lot of beauty pageants. And the reason for this was not some superficial judging of who was the prettiest girl at the ball, but the winner of the beauty pageant was actually the, the young woman who raised the most money, who did the most fundraising that would go into paying people's poll taxes. So it's very much tied back to advocacy and to writing some injustices that they would hold these events that were community events that got everybody involved, but they were tied back to political uh, means and political reasons. And again, tying this back to associate us as association professionals, the um, 
this is a non-dues revenue source, right? So having the, these these uh, beauty pageants as fundraisers helped Dr. Garcia and the GI Forum keep their their membership dues down, which eventually uh, helped to really spread membership. Um, I, I either passed it on a previous slide or I'll show it to you soon. But at one point, the GI Forum had over 150,000 members across the United States. And for a lot of us, that is a big number that is much bigger than what our association has. So he was able to, to leverage the, the culture of, of the membership into making dues lower and, and finding non-due non sources of revenue. Um, again, kind of speaking to the cultural ties to, to advocacy, uh, he didn't just stop with the young women. Uh, there were youth chapters that were created. There were women chapters that were created. And he really, uh, you know, again, as a family unit, being a very family oriented culture, he made sure to include the, um, the everyone that was in the family unit. So, you know, obviously youth chapters, they're, they're not veterans. They've never been to a war, but he, Dr. Garcia knew that leveraging this was um, was good to get the entire community involved and would also build a leadership pipeline as well. And that's something that that we all struggle with and we all focus on as association leaders. So as time went on, as the GI Forum uh, spread its influence and spread it, its efforts into other areas, there's a, a lot of important court cases that I'm gonna brush over, but I, I hope it gives you a good sense as to the significance of the GI Forum and the impact that, that they had on society. So um, you know, advocacy specifically, all of us again, probably have an advocacy arm within our organization. Um, there's a lot of court cases that were really impactful, and I just put two on, on the screen here, but one is Hernandez v. v. Texas. This was um, argued with LULAC, which is another association, if you're not familiar with them, they're, they're around today still, um, and argued before the Supreme Court in 1954. And one of the only reasons that you probably don't know about it is because it was on the same docket as Brown versus Board, which rightfully got a lot of the attention at the time. But this was also a significant court case. So to give you the, the Reader's Digest version of it, Hernandez was a murderer. There, there was no question about that. He murdered somebody. But what happened was that he was not tried by a jury of his peers. So uh, in Texas at the time, he was convicted by an all-white jury. And this was ap appealed and appealed eventually to the Supreme Court, not because the his lawyers were, were trying to advocate that he was innocent. Everybody knew he was guilty, admitted to it, but they wanted to, to advocate for the way that um, juries were being selected at the time and the injustice and the way that it needed to be corrected. So they eventually won this court case, and they did this by citing the, the data that within that county that he had been originally tried, something like uh, for the past 25 years, no person of uh, with a Spanish surname had served on a jury in that entire time. And the lawyers successfully argued before the Supreme Court that this denied him a jury of his peers. It was uh, in direct contradiction of the 14th Amendment, the Equal Protection Clause of the United States, and they got this reversed. And in some ways, Hernandez took a big risk with this. Um, again, everybody knew he was guilty, but his original conviction was just life behind bars. He knew if he appealed it, he would he could potentially get the death penalty. Um, so in some ways, you know, he he had a lasting impact. Uh, he definitely had a lasting impact on society, but he took a major risk for himself. This court case, a, a different Hernandez, but versus Driscoll um, Independent School Dister District within Texas, the Cliff Notes version of, of this one is that Mexican Americans for the first three years of their first grade education in Texas at the time, uh, or the first three years of their education were put in first grade automatically. So instead of every other child that, that passes first grade, that goes on to second grade, that goes on to third grade, Mexican Americans were put in a three-year first grade program that was justified because of language deficiencies. And in and, and at least one case, in the case that was argued before um, the, the, the judge in this case, the, the, the 
child who was put in that three-year first grade program didn't speak a word of Spanish. And um, they eventually got it overturned. But if, if you're an educator, if you have any sort of education background, even if you don't, you can imagine the, the stigma and the impact that it would have on you for repeating first grade three different times. And so Dr. Garcia and the GI Forum successfully uh, helped out with this case and helped to get these the, that, that program eliminated. Again, uh, I'm going to breeze over this, but there was a lot of partnership with LULAC. Again, it's another association on educational initiatives. And one of them tying kind of directly back to the, the previous slide about language deficiencies, you know, there were certainly children that only spoke Spanish. There were a lot of them. And one of the things that LULAC and the GI Forum did was to promote this program called the Little School of the 400, a really, really successful program that taught incoming kindergartners the 400 most basic words within the English language so they would start off on equal footing with their peers. And the program was so successful that it inspired Head Start, it in inspired the Bilingual Education Act, Title I of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. It was a um, really, really good program that, that has lasting impacts. On, on even today in, in education. Uh, some other areas that are in here. So I'm sure we've all heard about United Farm Workers. And I think that came in the chat earlier when I asked you about important events in Latino civil rights history. This is one that people you know, often know about. And so the GI Forum partnered with the, the UFW in some instances to promote their causes. So to promote, a, in this case, what this picture is from is a march from the Valley in Texas all the way to the Capitol in Austin for minimum uh, minimum wage for, for farm workers. So they, they partnered with them. As it relates to, again, us as association professionals, this one on the right here is even more important and might resonate even more with the, the folks on this call. So the, the Reader's Digest version of this one is in the 60s and 70s, uh, beer at the time was not like it is today. You couldn't go to your, your local store and, and find a hundred different varieties. There were really three types of beer in the United States, uh, you know, Coors, Miller, and Anheuser-Busch. And Coors was, quite frankly, really racist at the time. And they did not hire Mexicans. It was Their, their headquarters were in Colorado, had, had a large um, Hispanic population there. They excluded Mexicans from their hiring practices. It's very discriminatory. And so a national boycott uh, was called. And this was a, a joint effort between the GI Forum and a local Colorado organization called the Crusade for Justice. But it had a lasting impact on, on not just CORS, but the you know, wider United States, too. Um, and again, tying it back to us as association professionals, when CORS eventually relented, when they said, okay, we're gonna change our ways. It took quite a long time um, up until the late seventies. And this action actually didn't, what I'm about to describe didn't occur to the eighties, but they said, okay, we're gonna change our ways. Of course, companies said, we're gonna change our ways and we're gonna, we're gonna commit $350 million, $350 million to support Hispanic community businesses and causes under an umbrella association. And for many of us on the call, we might know this. We might know their leader right now, Sid Wilson, ACER, the Hispanic uh, Association for Corporate Responsibility, which itself has sprung other associations. It had a, a lasting impact, uh, again, not just on history and civil rights, but you know, tying it back to our industry as associations, uh, an association that we all know very well. Some other areas that the GI Forum had a, a lasting impact on in, in their advocacy efforts as a nonprofit, uh, this one might even be the biggest that, that, that I'm talking about. It's the it, Viva uh, Kennedy Clubs. And so what happened is that in 1960, there was an election, refresh your memory here, between uh, John Kennedy and uh, Richard Nixon. So the, this is in 1960. Everybody expected Richard Nixon to win. A lot of factors influenced that ultimately not happening. But one of the really impactful ones was the relationship, was a result of the relationship that 
LBJ, the vice president on the ticket, had with Dr. Garcia at the time. So the Kennedys and, and Johnson met with Dr. Garcia as the, as the campaign season was going on and said, there's a really uh, untapped potential here to uh, for us as Democrats to court the, the Mexican vote. What do you think we can do to, to appeal to them more, to, to get them to come out to vote for us and to help us with this election cause? And again, Dr. Garcia being a man who's uh, not modest, I guess to say, and, and a man of action, um, said, give me two weeks and I'll get you 90% of the vote. And what he did was create these Viva Kennedy clubs. And if you uh, Google it, you'll see even like um, Jackie Kennedy speaking in Spanish for the Viva Kennedy clubs. It's really interesting. But uh, they, they were really impactful. And Dr. Garcia delivered. He, he, he created this grassroots organization. And by the slimmest of margins, the 1960 election was decided. And particularly in the states of Texas and Illinois, where the Viva Kennedy clubs were the strongest and where they helped deliver the Hispanic vote for Kennedy. And so this isn't just uh, an election that, you know, you know, fun fact, the election went one way or the other. This, again, is incredibly important to American history. If you remember that the Cuban Missile Crisis happened under Kennedy's administration, Things could have turned out very differently if Nixon was president at the time. And you can go back to the Viva Kennedy clubs as one of the factors that decided the course of history there. And go back even further, that relationship that Dr. Garcia, the GI Forum, created with Lyndon Johnson early on during the Longoria affair to, uh, to impact and uh, affect history in that way. Uh, some other presidential relationships that were there. So again, you know, I've mentioned Kennedy uh, and, and the the relationship that was there. Um, certainly, after Kennedy was assassinated, the relationship with LBJ continued on. Side note or interesting tidbit: the day before Kennedy was assassinated, he was actually visiting in Texas a Viva Kennedy club. Um, so there, there's a lot of connections here. You might recognize uh, a young ver or an older version of this gentleman right here, Bill Clinton. Uh, Dr. Garcia and, and Clinton forged a relationship in a gubernatorial campaign in Texas in the 70s. And that relationship would endure over the decades. Clinton actually gave um, a, a call to Dr. Garcia when he was on his deathbed. He released a really, released a really nice statement when he died, um, highlighting the, the relationship that they had forged over the years. And Dr. Garcia was also a recipient, recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor that can be bestowed uh, um, to a civilian from a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, here at, in 1984. And I want to... My first job after college. How's that? Um, I, I want to highlight something else here. A, a speech that LBJ made to Congress in March of 1965. To give you a little bit of context, he is calling on Congress to pass the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which, which would later get passed about six months later. Um, this is one of the single most important civil rights pieces of legislation in United States history, the Voting Rights Act. It, it eliminated things like the poll tax and literacy tests that I mentioned earlier. It also provided for um, different languages when people were voting so they could understand the ballots, which is obviously very important to our community. It is an extremely important moment within civil rights history. And it is often framed as kind of a black white issue and it largely is, I'm not taking anything away from that. The, this message to Congress was given a week after um, Selma, Alabama and the, the, the peaceful march that was disrupted and people were killed and very badly injured um, that, that was more from the African-American experience. But when LBJ went to Congress and made the plea for this legislation, he tied his message back to his experience as a Mexican, as a teacher in a Mexican school. And I, I don't have any evidence to back this up, but I have no doubt that this was at least partially influenced by the relationship that he that he had with Dr. Garcia over the years and the constant um, 
the constant sometimes criticism or, <laughs> or uh, opinions that Dr. Garcia gave to LBJ uh, throughout his political career. And so I, I want to just play this. It's a couple minutes long, the, the clip that LBJ talks about from his experience as a school teacher. It's really significant because this is the first time a sitting president has addressed to Congress the, the issues within our community. First job after college was as a teacher in Cotula, Texas, in a small Mexican American school. Few of them could speak English, and I couldn't speak much Spanish. My students were. Poor, and they often came to class without breakfast, hungry. And they knew, even in their youth, the pain of prejudice. They never seemed to know why people disliked them, but they knew it was so, because I saw it in their eyes. I often walked home late in the afternoon after the classes were finished, wishing there was more that I could do. But all I knew was to teach them the little that I knew, hoping that it might help them against the hardships that lay ahead. And somehow, you never forget what poverty and hatred can do when you see its scars on the hopeful face of a young child. I never thought then, in 1928, that I would be standing here in 1965. It never even occurred to me in my fondest dreams that I might have the chance to help the sons and daughters of those students and to help people like them all over this country. But now I do have that chance. And I'll let you in on a secret. I mean to use it. So again, really powerful message there. Um, this is within the context of um, a much larger speech. So it wasn't just um, you know, that individual me message for our community that he said it was within the larger civil rights movement at the time. But again, um, it was really influenced by both LBJ's personal experience as a school teacher. But again, I, I, I can't help but think that Dr. Garcia, with his constant influence over the years, um, influenced LB, LBJ's decision to include that within the, um, within the speech. So, you know, lastly, I've got one, one of my last slides here. I know we're getting towards the top of the hour. Um, I, I've given a lot of examples about how Dr. Garcia, the GI Forum, Felix and Goria, all these different events have influenced um, American history, right? And you know, sub-layer to that, influenced us as association professionals and some of the way that our uh, industry has evolved over time and it gives us good lessons into how you can uh, you can advocate, how you can use the press, how you can develop relationships over time. But I can say uh, quite personally that th all of these actions impacted me. I would not be here today. I, I can tell you that without a doubt. And the reason for that is going back to this picture that I showed earlier. Uh, in this picture, this is what I showed you from the youth chapters of the GI Forum that were created. This gentleman right here, I think he's on the call today, uh, is about 17 years old. And this is my father, Roli Segare. And he, a few years prior to this, was a 13-year-old runaway living on a fishing boat. Not making that up. 13-year-old runaway living on a fishing boat. And he was so inspired by what he had heard from Dr. Garcia at the time that he dedicated his life to the similar causes and to fighting these injustices. And when I say that I wouldn't be here today, it's because my father's journey brought him to 
uh, DC and he met my mother. And again, I would not be here. That that connection would not have happened without everything that Dr. Garcia did. So I, you know, I, I owe my life to him uh, for, for lack of a, a better phrase. And um, it's, it's a really good example of, again, that leadership pipeline of how if you do good things, you can inspire the next generation. If you set up systems where you can have that pipeline and you, you can get people involved early in their career, they uh, will really have a, a big impact on society. And for those of you that don't know me or don't know my, my backstory, my father uh, led the largest advocacy group, the National Council of La Raza for Hispanic Americans for 30 years. And it'll be later going to become an ambassador for the Dominican Republic or to the Dominican Republic, I should say, the United States has also received the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, just a couple of years ago. So again, you know, kind of impacting the next generation, Dr. Garcia, the GI Forum, this veteran presence, the, vet, the, the veterans group really had such a huge impact there um, on me personally and a lot of other folks as well. I think some of my siblings are on the call so they can echo uh, those um, those sentiments there that they would not be here. And so, you know, kind of to wrap this all up, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, so tying it back to us as association professionals, uh, some of my takeaways are be bold. Be bold like Dr. Garcia. Uh, even if you are an unknown at the time, don't be afraid to reach out to the, 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 the levers of power within this country because you don't know what's going to happen. That relationship that he formed with LBJ as a result of the Felix Longoria affair really did impact history. Uh, also, understand context. Everything that I went into to talk about the, the landscape of Three Rivers, Texas, how it was divided, how you had some of the stakeholders who were more conservative, some that, that wanted to, to challenge it, the context of World War II at the time, um, understand how to leverage the landscape to, to meet your needs and to tailor your messaging really to your audience so that you can achieve those. Um, again, building relationships is very important. Building that pipeline is also very important. And just advocate, you know, don't, don't be afraid. The worst anybody can say is no, and you need to get your message out there. If you're interested in this talk, there's several books out that will go into a lot more detail and what I reference, uh, use for references for a lot of my slides, they're on the screen right now. There is also a fantastic PBS documentary that sadly isn't online anymore, but you can get some clips if you uh, Google the Felix Longoria Affair. It does a really good job of um, showing the different perspectives of the townspeople, even not today, but at the time in the um, early aughts or mid aughts, that um, how some of the the, the white community felt a regarding the Felix Longoria affair and Dr. Garcia, and they contrasted that with a lot of the things that, that I went over today. 